Hey, welcome everyone to another episode of the Two Abdullahs. Today it's going to be lit. It's going to be an exciting show. We have the apostate prophet Ridwan joining us today. And how is everyone doing? So before we get started, I want everyone to go go right to the stream. Click on the thumbs up. Click on the thumbs up because we want lots of people to come and join and see the show. It's going to be an excellent show. So before anyone else does anything else, click the thumbs up. We have no thumbs down yet, which is a good sign. Good sign. Uh, and uh, yeah, how is everyone doing? Uh, Apostate Prophet, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I already did uh, did the thumbs up yesterday, so I don't have to do that. Uh, but thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here. <laughs> Awesome. Gondal, uh, how's, uh, how's everything on your end? Hello, everybody. Nice to have you guys back again. It's a special episode with Apostate Prophet, and it's going to be fun. Uh, we're going to be going through uh, some of the silly Islamic narrations in the Quran and Hadith. Uh, in fact, like we were going through them before we started, and we found out there are some new ones that even all of us haven't come across before. So it's going to make for some co cool uh, discussions, and we're going to talk about, I had some talking points like... Uh, uh, some silliness of the apologists, the moon splitting, why did Allah stop these miracle events, you know, then we'll talk about some authenticity of miracles, and then some contemporary uh, drama going on on YouTube between uh, AP and some, uh, some Muslim apologists, but uh, let's get back to it. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, before we jump into the slides, let's just go to some of the Let's talk about some of the drama that's been going on, uh, some of the back and forth uh, AP. So what's going on with Sajid? You and Sajid had a little <laughs> bit uh, back and forth, Sajid Lipham. So if any people don't know, Sajid Lipham is uh, a Salafi Muslim. I think he studied Medina. Yeah. He's been one of the guys that's been, you know, publicly attacking Yasir Qadi as well. So this is like the neo-Salafi crowd, the, the crew that thinks they know better than the own scholars who have like more experience more maturity you know actually imams in the community were like talking to people like you know sajid was one of those guys right of the bashing yq for yeah. uh, making that zombies video oh how dare he say the zombies in the Quran are stuff for a lot like blah, blah, blah. whereas <laughs> yasukati is trying to do damage control trying to keep people muslim he's trying his best you know you got these uh these uh young salafi guys are uh, just like shut up you don't know anything you're an idiot <laughs> uh so but he apparently he's been going back and forth with you now so what's going on with that well it's it's funny um what happened how it started is that you know there's this muslim uh, apologist preacher guy called um uthman ibn farooq and um he put up this this billboard which says uh jesus uh will return jesus is a muslim are you or something like that and i found that very funny and i thought hey i never actually talked about um the whole absurdity of the idea that jesus was a muslim which muslims always claim you know and um I just made a short video. I didn't want to extensively talk about it. I just made a short video in which I said you know, that the title was uh, "Was Jesus a Muslim?" And in that video, I basically uh, briefly explained, without even going into any uh, sources or anything, just explained the logic of how absurd it is to claim that uh, the Christian sources of Jesus are corrupt and false because Christians corrupted them, and you cannot trust the Christian narrative because Christians don't have any evidence for their for their uh, interpretation of jesus but you are supposed to trust the islamic sources which uh have no evidence which have nothing which are only based on the quran and muhammad which came 600 years later and i basically explained that we have a uh, historical jesus that uh, may or may not have existed but which we have no uh, reason to doubt and if we go further into uh, non-historical sources then the next uh, thing that we could trust would be the earliest writings about Jesus which are the Christian sources which are uh, texts in the new in the New Testament the Gospels and uh, epistles so and, and I said basically this is the most reasonable thing to do so why would you go to the to the Islamic sources it's absurd and what Sajid did as a response was then to uh, make a video and to insult me and to basically say that the Gospels actually confirm the idea that Jesus was a Muslim. 
uh, and that you cannot find the divinity and the son of God idea in the Gospels. You only find that in later texts. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this to me is 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 such a joke because I know uh, this is basically Ahmed Didat. Ahmed Didat popularized this idea, this false idea. And he is basically, if people don't know, if you're too young to know Ahmed Dida, you're probably quite young. But Zaka Naik is the is a protege of Ahmed Dida. So yeah. the same style like Zaka Naik, like coming on this thing and arguing and shouting. Although Ahmed Dida actually used to debate people. Zaka Naik doesn't like debate people, right? It seems like he's scared of debate. But Ahmed Dida was actually debating. And he would use these very showman tactics, not very scholarly tactics, but he'd bring up a Bible and say, I'll pay anyone $100 who can show me where in the Bible it says Jesus is God. And of course, you know, it's very dramatic. It's very funny. It's very exciting. Muslims love it. The cheering, the clapping, takbir, takbir. But like, it's it's a joke. Like, it's yeah. it's completely through the, the from the beginning to the end of the gospel. And I don't even, we don't even need to go to, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, whether Jesus existed, you know, the mythicism, uh -huh. like I'm leaning towards, you know, not like Richard Carrier that Jesus didn't exist, but more towards like Bart Ehrman, Jesus did exist. He was an apost apostolic, rabbi rabbianic uh, preacher, messiah type figure who was executed by the Romans, right? So that's what yeah, I lean yeah. towards. I think his, he is much more, there's, there's more scholarly evidence behind that position. Uh -huh. But as for the historicity, like, I don't even care because they're not claiming that. They're claiming the Bible. They're saying the Bible says Jesus is not God. Yeah. To me, this is such a clown statement to make. Like, it's such a joke. It's a complete, like, it's such an idiotic thing to say. The Bible doesn't say Jesus is the son of God or God or however you want to put it. Uh -huh. It's a complete joke because that's exactly what it says. That's That's the whole point of Christianity from the beginning. It's always been about Jesus being the sacrifice, the Messiah, like they took, and anyone that listens, and you know, Muslims are big fans of Bar Ehrman. So if they listen to Bar Ehrman, they'll know that what he's saying is that Jesus, the, the, whole, the whole point of Christianity was because Jesus was executed. So the Jews were like, how is it, how, this was a big problem for them. Like they, they weren't expecting the Messiah, which means king, to be executed. Mm -hmm. They were expecting him to be the king. Yeah. And according to Bert Ehrman, this was probably, you know, from the Roman perspective, this was considered like uh, an act of treason saying that I'm going to be the king. This is one theory. I may not be true, but basically if this was a case, this could have been why they wanted him executed. They didn't want any competition, right? Or it could have been, you know, someone basically ratted him out or whatever. But the point is that when he died, this caused a huge dilemma. And, you know, this was like, okay, now what do we do? Like this was supposed to be, the fulfillment of a prophecy was Jesus was yeah. supposed to be Messiah, but he is executed. So now they made a new doctrine, which is where Christianity came from. But for for Muslims to say Christianity never said that, that just it just blows my mind. Like that that does that makes zero sense, right? It's like Abraham was a Muslim. <clears throat> it's like as he, bad as that, right? Like here are the here are the facts. You know, the earliest texts that you find about Jesus are actually uh, texts within the New Testament uh, epistles, the Paul's epistles. And if you look at those, Jesus is clearly described as the Son of God, as divine, as the Son of the Father, together with the Holy Spirit. And he will come back to save us. This is what we have to do. We have to wait for our Savior to come back. And uh, so th th this is, this is the, the, the first texts say exactly that. The texts that come after this historically are the Gospels, which we have today, the four Gospels. And if you look at those, especially if you look at the last one, at, uh, the Gospel of John, if you look at those Gospels, they clearly give the message that uh, Jesus said he will uh, be killed on the cross. He will be, he will, he will be killed. He will be raised on the third day. Uh, he's the son of God. He's one with God. God has given him judgment. He gives life just like God. He has to be praised uh, and, and honored like God. He, uh, God is within him. He and God are one. He's the son of God and so on. Like it's, says all of these things and he, and here you have a muslim coming and saying well you know all of those sources the earliest sources that we have no we cannot trust it they are all corrupt what should we trust instead the quran which came 600 years later and according to the quran jesus was a muslim this is the truth and nothing else i mean <laughs> do i even have to point out how how dumb that is <laughs> Well, talking about like how weirdly like Jesus placed in uh, Islamic mythology, 
I just am sharing a hadith from uh, Riyadh al-Salihina, actually from Sahih Muslim, if you want to put my screen on the thing. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Is my volume still very low? Yeah, it's it's a bit low. You can check, check okay. your mic settings after. Um, that's okay. fine. All right. So here it says, uh, talking about the Day of Judgment, like when uh, Jesus will come, uh, he says, he will then call that young man and he will come forward laughing with his face gleaming out of joy. And it will be at this time that Jesus will descend at the white minaret in the eastern side of Damascus, wearing two garments, lightly dyed and placing his hands on the wings of two angels. So he's going to show up like descending like this <laughs> in like, I guess, a tobe or something. <laughs> And then when he will lower his head, drops of water would fall from it. And when he will raise it up, drops like pearls would scatter from it. It's like, you know, when that mermaid or comes out of the water and does this. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that. But then he goes like he'll go searching for the jaw and then go kill him there. Obviously, Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is the holy land. And yeah, but and then of of course, Gog and Magog will show up to finish it all off. But I mean, it's the silliness that just blows my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, guys, w w one funny thing was that uh, I brought up how uh, Muslims also believe they do not only believe that Jesus was a Muslim, they also believe that Jesus will come back as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> I said uh, Muslims believe that. Um, or Islam teaches that Jesus will come back and he will uh, break the cross and kill the pigs and uh, fight for Islam. That's what I said in my yeah. initial video. Yeah. And Sajid's response to that was like, and now he's just using loaded language. What Islam <laughs> teaches is what Islam teaches is basically that Jesus will come back and declare the truth and declare Christianity wrong. And and I thought, wait, what? The, what? what? I'm using loaded language, <laughs> dude. I'm I'm quoting Muhammad directly. <laughs> you know it's it's worse than that because it says no more jizya will be accepted what does that mean yeah it will be that, abolished which which, which means uh which the means minorities that, yeah yes yeah, well, they will be fought it's like it's worse than, yeah gondola you want to share something else yeah like this one where it's explicitly said that jesus will descend amongst you he will break the cross kill the pigs <laughs> and abolish the jizzy attack. Why, why is he killing the pigs? I never got that. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I think Muhammad was offended that Christians eat pigs or something. Like, I don't know. Just leave but, the yeah. pigs around it. <laughs> because I, I think that's one thing that distinguishes um, Christians from Jews, right? And Muslims is that they eat pig because, uh, you know, the, 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 the law was, uh, was fulfilled through the sacrifice of Jesus, which I don't... I guess they don't like that for some reason. Yeah. Uh, so th this this whole thing about the corruption of the Bible drives me crazy too, because you know it's so clear that Islam doesn't understand what the Bible is. Like there's there's no there's no mention of of Pope. The Pope, you know, the Catholic Church was the biggest sect of Christianity for thousands of years. I think even before Islam, yet there's no mention of a Pope in the in the Quran. There's no even idea that there's such a thing, right? It seems that Muhammad had a very specific view of Christianity, you know, probably Nestorian Christianity or something, mm -hmm. some sort of heterodox, you know, you know, probably like almost like a heretical sect of Christianity that, you know, it says in the Quran, don't say Mary Trinity. Yeah. Mary is not part of the like where did where did that no, come nobody, from? Nobody says that. <laughs> yeah, like nobody nobody says that, right? It is so ridiculous. Yeah, the, yeah, the Quran clearly clearly says uh it says that Allah will say to Jesus, did you say to the people, uh, take me and my mother is deities besides Allah? And yeah. it's funny, nobody says it. No Christian says that. It's like, what, yeah, why, yeah. Does the, why does the Quran address it? There are no Christians who say something like that. Well, what about yeah, yeah, yeah. even the Uzair being the son of Allah? Yeah, that's another Jews. thing. Who says that? Would you <laughs> say that? <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it's a very general statement. It says uh, that Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah and Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah. Uh, may Allah destroy them both. Like, which Jew says that? We don't even have any historical uh, records of anyone saying that ever. It's like, it's dumb. you know, You know, I love that statement. That statement is such a checkmate right there for, for Muslims because in the same exact statement, it uses the literal meaning of son of God for Jesus. Uh -huh. So you can't even say it's metaphorical. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's saying they say he's literally the son of God, and Jews say, so unless you're going to say the first half of the sentence is literal, the second half of the sentence is metaphorical. It means like a father or something like what? It's like it's so clear. It's talking about literal yeah. son of God, right? <clears throat> you know, there, there is even a hadith that's funny. There is even uh, a series of hadith which mention that whole thing again, in which Muhammad describes that uh, on the day of judgment, Allah will uh, bring the Jews, or He will call the He will call the Christians, and He will say, uh, "Did you say that the, the Messiah is is also Allah, or is the son of Allah, or something like that?" And they will be punished for for their saying. And then He will call the Jews, and He will ask them, "Did you say Ezra is the son of Allah? Who told you this?" And he will basically then punish the Jews for saying that. That's what the hadith <laughs> say, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's um, yeah. Th it seems like history wasn't a strong point for the author yeah. of the Quran. In fact, yeah. I just found this uh, website. It's jo Dr. Jonathan Brown's uh, website from twenty. Yeah, he did a he response wrote, to this, eh? Uh, Quran and the Jews, and he actually yeah. does says that he's generally Jews just don't believe it. And he finds this one instance of it, and that too doesn't really make sense because the Quran is a timeless book for all Jews and all people so it shouldn't be just limited to one Jewish sect and not mention their correct belief at all <laughs> you know just a but yeah it's a very interesting read if you want to go through it just sharing this yeah I did I did uh, on my blog I have this an article on this to very topic I looked into this mm -hmm. in great detail because I do think that this is one of the biggest mistakes in the Quran uh, but going yeah. back to the Christianity thing um, again it's so obvious that you know it's obvious to me that Jesus is not God. Bible is not literally true, but it's also obvious to me that whoever wrote the Quran had no idea what the gospel was, right? There's yeah. this Injil, yeah. Injil, Injil. There's the Injil. There's no four gospels, but there's no such thing as Injil. There's no gospel. It's actually four gospels. And the very earliest gospel preached the divinity of Jesus. Like, yeah. the, like Jesus is God. So, you know, it's just, it's so wrong from beginning to end. And, you know, I, my eyes opened up to this after kind of around the time I was doubting Islam. I was looking for content. I started reading and, um, you know, looking at David Wood's content as well. And he actually made some really good points. For example, one of the points, I think it was from David Wood, is that Jesus doesn't fit in to Islamic theology. It makes no, he makes no sense. Not at all. You have yeah. all of these prophets. And for some reason, just for some reason, God decided, Allah decided, okay, Jesus has no dad. And then just continued the rest of them, everyone else has a dad. But like in well, Christianity... Adam and Eve didn't have parents either. Right? <laughs> that's what the Quran says, right? That's what the Quran says. But, but there's a reason for Adam and Eve not having a dad because they're the first humans. What's the reason for Jesus? What's the reason for interrupting the human lineage for Jesus? Yeah. Whereas in Christianity, like the story fits in. Like it makes sense. It's not, it's, I don't believe it, but at least it's consistent. Like he has no dad his dad is God. In Islam, he has no dad, and that's just it. He just has no dad. It's, it's more than he, he has no dad. He had a virgin birth. He came. He apparently preached something. Nobody knows what he preached. He died. He was completely, uh, he was a complete failure. Nothing uh, authentic is left from him. So why the hell did he come? Why the hell did Allah send him under these very dramatic circumstances? You know, Actually, that's a good point. It makes no sense. Actually, Not only that, the other thing that, that, that makes me laugh is the way he failed created the biggest false religion yeah, yeah. in the worship of in the in on mankind yeah. which is allah's fault <laughs> allah did that allah made it look like he was like if this is if this isn't such a joke by now like how do people believe this it's like yeah i'm gonna take this religious story that christians believe and i'm gonna change it i'm gonna say yeah i made him look like he was crucified <laughs> I'm just Why would do you do that? Here. Huh? I'm just doing some math here because the hadith says there's been 124,000 prophets. Yeah, yeah. yeah How yeah. many years? Like, okay, let's do the past 10,000 years. We know, like, after the agricultural revolution and human civilization really took you started, right? Do the math. 10,000 divided by 124,000. Man, these prophets have been coming like raindrops from the sky yeah. and still Allah failed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, none of them were successful. It's very funny when you think about it. We talked about this yesterday with David uh, on, on our live stream. Uh, the, the Islamic teaching is that there were 124,000 prophets. They were sent to all mankind. And the Quran's message is clearly that Allah uh, never punishes a nation unless he sends a prophet to them to warn them and to 
to tell them, hey, stop disbelieving, believe in Allah. So this is the point. It is uh, about justice. Allah sends prophets that warn these people so that they have a chance to believe in the truth. And then Allah... Uh, Allah does does the whole accounting and punishes them and rewards them. But then if you look at history, you see we have no records at all of any of those prophets appearing and successfully preaching any message anywhere. We do not have any scripture. We have nothing at all. After Muhammad's time, we have 1,400 years with people all around the world again without any messenger, without any yeah. prophet who warns them about the truth. Oh, yeah. So what exactly is the point of that? It makes no sense. I all, all of the prophets too, all on the Middle East too. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like we don't find this this theology in China and like anywhere outside of. I mean, obviously it, it reached that eventually, but uh, like you said, it's it's all in one place, right? Um, and yeah. someone saying, I still don't get Jesus coming back to Earth. The reason for Jesus coming back is simply put, is because it says that in Christianity. Yeah. So Muhammad was taking as many things as like it's. What's the point of killing Jesus on the cross? There's no point except that's part of Christianity. So he had to somehow include that into Islam, which again makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, so somehow I, what did, what did Jesus do? Jesus, Jesus called the Jews to worship one God. He was like, hey guys, worship Allah, worship Allah. But that's they, what they did. They worship yeah, one God already. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. It's redundant. I feel Allah is very <laughs> redundant and inefficient. I just did some math. So if you divide 124,000 by, let's say, 10,000 years, you get the figure of 12.4. So there should be a prophet every 12.4 years for the past 10,000 years. <laughs> this is the back of the envelope calculation, but holy. <laughs> that's yeah, that's, that's crazy. Oh, and, by, then, and none in the last 1,400 years. Yeah, because Muhammad is the but last hey, one, right? A prophet should be sent to every nation. Before Muhammad, prophets were sent to all, yeah. all different yeah. nations. Yeah. Only Muhammad was supposedly, according to the according to himself, only Muhammad was sent to the <laughs> to the to the entire world. All the other prophets were sent to their yeah. own people. So there's yeah. local prophets, national and international prophets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It should be international yeah, you know, and of prophets. Or something. That's another. That's another interesting point. There's, there's a contradiction between there's two things here to mention. One is that there's a prophet sent to every nation or a messenger or whatever. Then there's also another statement that if you didn't get the message, and a lot of Muslims make this into like a majority thing that if you didn't get the message, then you're excused. Whereas, well, if Allah did His job properly, then why would there be like holes in the it's like you're creating a, like a postal service, you're God, yet you fail to deliver your message to like a bunch of people. Like what you 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 created this, it's or you created a video game and it's full of bugs. Like half of the levels don't work. You can never reach some of the jet like there's some diamonds you have to get to, but like you can never get to them, right? The dwellers, they made it impossible or something. He sent right? 124,000 patches to update the bugs. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then the and and but, but yet you know you have you have Muslims, especially like Hamza Yusuf style, style Muslims, <clears throat> that say that the majority of, of non-Muslims are not kafirs. That's what they say. They say the majority of non-Muslims are not kafir. Why? What does kafir mean? Someone that denies the truth willingly and you know knowingly. So like we would be probably ka probably would be kafir because we know Islam. Yeah, but apparently, yeah. like, you know, your grandma, or, you know, some some white lady that lives in, you know, New York, even though she knows about Islam, even though she's heard of Prophet and she doesn't like Islam, she would not be Catholic, supposedly. What the hell and is the point? <laughs> this is kind of unfair to us that who did hear about Islam, yeah, right? So yeah, for example, yeah. if I'm living away far away mm -hmm. and I never heard about Islam, I can party and do whatever I want in this life and still go to heaven in the afterlife. But if there's somebody who's heard of Islam, well, shit, now you have to accept it or you're screwed. You know. Well, this this thing comes up with Christianity, too, because people say, then, what's the point of giving the message? With mm -hmm. Islam, though, there is there is a hadith that says you'll be tested on the Day of Judgment. Remember that one? <laughs> so, like, yeah, <laughs> Allah fixed his bugs in the afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm, I'm still stuck on the whole thing. Uh, 1,024, uh, 124,000 patches. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good analogy. Well, the, the funny thing is the Quran actually... Um, 
the Quran completely messes up its whole message because it doesn't get this whole thing right. The whole, um, you know, being just and uh, holding people accountable for uh, knowing and rejecting the Quran. The Quran makes different approaches and it tells Muhammad that uh, he has to warn everybody and those who warn, uh, who were warned have no choice but to obey. And then it keep, and then it says after Muhammad is unsuccessful, the Quran says, uh, there is nothing you can do, O Prophet. Uh, if Allah wanted them to believe, they would believe. But what the hell does that mean, man? And what does that mean? What does believing mean? What does believing in, entail? Believing means if I believe in Islam, that means I have been uh, consciously, cognitively, uh, knowingly convinced that Islam is true, which is why I uh, decided, okay, hey, you know what? It makes sense. I believe in Islam. Okay, I am now a Muslim. I should one la ilaha illallah, and so on. So th th this is what I would what I would do. You know, if I, that means believing, believing means being convinced that it is the truth. If it is in Allah's hands, if Allah can decide whether I believe or not, mm -hmm. doesn't that mean that it is in Allah's hands whether I'm convinced or not? How is that my fault? If if I do not believe, if it simply seems absurd to me, and this is the truth, this is what it is. And Muslims come here doubting our 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 motives, but I say very honestly uh, and very clearly to you. I simply do not believe that Islam is true. I simply believe that it is absurd. I believe it is stupid, which is why I make fun of it. I think it is dangerous and wrong, which is why I reject it and criticize it. If I did believe that it was true, if I only had a doubt that it was possibly true, I would not make fun of it. I would acknowledge it and believe in it. And according to the Quran, if Allah wanted me to believe, then I would believe. So how does that make sense? Yeah. And and I mean, to be honest, Allah needs to um, be able to take a little bit of a joke. He is the creator of the fucking universe. <laughs> yeah, so if you yeah. make fun of it, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, He'll yeah. get over it. Yeah. I mean, if I can get over the people making fun of me on YouTube and you can, <laughs> I'm sure the creator of the fucking universe doesn't need to get butt hurt over a few insignificant homo sapiens, you know, joking around at the end of the day. Right. Like, I mean, Yes, but exactly true. If you didn't, if you did, did believe, you don't just believe it's false. You know it's false. There's not even a doubt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's like, you know, when people ask us, is there any chance of us going back to Islam? I mean, theoretically, but Zero. how? How? Like, you know, it's like too, it's, it's it's too silly and too dumb. Like it's straight up like not gonna not trying to be condescending, but it is borderline. <laughs> Low IQ bullshit. That is what it is. <laughs> I'll be, yeah, I'll be straight up. Like you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. I see. I see no. I see no reason why I would ever convert or revert back to Islam. It's just so. It. I, I am completely convinced that it is complete bullshit. There is no. Yeah. I. I see no possibility of ever converting back to Islam. And it's not like to me like now Islam. When I think about Islam, it in my head it occupies the same space as scientology mormonism flds yeah man because it yeah, is yeah. it it is equally bad or yeah. like some yeah there is this religion this new religion this new religious movement that uh i was kind of interested in for fun which, which is called uh realism it's this um this guy who claims to have communicated with some divine beings uh aliens who actually came far in the past and who brought humans to the earth and brought them a message and they were known as the elohim and uh, they will come back to save us and to give us extremely advanced knowledge and technology once we humans achieve uh, complete peace and once we stop hating and fighting each other that's his message and his whole uh, religion his whole cult is basically just people um I don't know fraternizing, having coming together and having sex and <laughs> being being totally being totally open and peaceful and stuff like that. And I look at that guy and he has a strange haircut, like he's bald on top and has hair on the sides. And he says he communicates with aliens. And I feel like, dude, that that's that's the same. That's that's just like Muhammad to me. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to? I want to respond to this comment, Bill Gonda. I'll let you respond to this. Uh, low IQ bullshit, but very intellectual people believe in that. Explain that to Abduls. It's funny that he's using the word, uh, he's Muslim, and he's using the word Abduls as a slur, <laughs> which is a slur against Muslims. <laughs> uh, you don't do that. Yeah. 
okay. like are you encouraging us to call people i i don't even do that because i think it's disrespectful i mean i was telling I'll one of my explain mods my comment and yeah. what i mean by low iq is the ideas and the set of ideas contained in the islamic theology are very right now i'm not saying that every muslim is low iq or or terribly and not smart no something what happens with smart people is compartmentalization of knowledge where where you store your religious beliefs is in a different part of the brain so you don't really look at them or analyze them with the same uh, rigor uh, that you do with the uh, the world around you so you'll see like i've i actually know cosmologists with phds astro astronomers who believe the earth is 6000 years old right and they'll be working for nasa you'll have muslim doctors and muslim neuroscientists who will try to explain to you that genies possessing you are real right so what Sam Harris said that uh, religion can make sane people believe in things that only lunatics could believe on their own. And that's the point that I'm getting to. Uh, yes, we're not saying Muslims are low IQ, but saying that this, these things, are, it, you know, it, if you were presented these things, like, like Apostate Prophet just presented the most ridiculous religion. If I... And, you know, Abdul Gondal's done this on his Facebook. He's taken an Islamic story of Muhammad speaking to the genie in the cave. Sorry, not the genie, the angel in the cave. And he changed the words to say, Zinu, the great god Zinu sent this message to this prophet. I forgot the prophet's name or whatever. <laughs> and and everyone's laughing at it until they get to the end. They're like, oh, I, I changed the word Zinu to Allah. And, you know, and it's the same thing. It's just the Islamic story of revelation or whatever. But like when you present it to it in a different context, you'll laugh at it. But when you present it to it as, you know, under the guise of childhood indoctrination, it's very difficult to let go of that, right? Um, do you, okay, I'm gonna share your screen, Gondal, and then we'll jump to the, yeah, the slides. The but this is something that I wrote kind of like a mockery, but just switching the words <laughs> around. And it's basically literally uh, changing the words of the Quran verses. If you look at it, it's chapter 16 verses 101 to 109. And when you zoom in a bit? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Control plus on the keyboard. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thanks. So Zenu knows best, it's where Allah is and all that. But when you read it this way and you think about it and then you realize, holy shit, this is actually really terrible, hateful, and the way it's written. <laughs> Can you read it? So <laughs> when we substitute a command in place of another, Zenu knows best what he reveals. <laughs> They say, you are making it up, but most of them don't know. <laughs> hey, the holy robot has brought it down from your horn. <laughs> Truthfully, in order to stabilize those who believe and as guidance and good news for those who submit. We are all well aware that they say it is a human being who is teaching him by the tongue of who they allude to is foreign. Well, this is in clear English tongue. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. <laughs> Those who do not believe in Zenu's revelations, Zenu will not guide them. And for them is a painful punishment. <laughs> it is those who do not believe in Zenu's revelations who fabricate falsehood. <laughs> These are the liars. Whoever renounces faith in Zenu after having believed, except for someone who is compelled while his heart rests securely in faith. <laughs> but whoever willingly opens up his heart to disbelief, upon them falls the wrath of Zenu. And for them is a tremendous torment. That is because they have preferred the worldly <laughs> life to the hereafter, and because Zenu does not guide the people who refuse. It is they who Zenu has sealed their brains and their ears and their eyes. It is they who are heedless. There's no doubt in the hereafter, they will be the losers. At, at least you got the brain part right instead of the heart. It's Because kind of... <laughs> the Quran says heart and you say brain, that's actually accurate. But yeah. <laughs> But when oh, you do it like God. this, you realize, oh boy, it's terrible. <laughs> I'm crying, laughing here. You know, you know what's so, funny? You should actually show this to uh, to to a regular Muslim who doesn't really know much about the <laughs> contents of the Quran, and tell him, and show him show him how absurd and how ridiculous this is. That we find. <laughs> I mean, that's the point. I mean, you know, the funny thing is, I'm just one last thing before we get to the slides. Like Surah Fakaf, that whoever wrote it i'm not going to mention that was the point of it is to make you realize like how stupid the quran is and of course farid 
was was like criticizing Sulafakov, saying, "Ah, this doesn't make sense, crushing and then hanging." Dude, that's what the Quran does. <laughs> it's saying, "Well, you know, we'll, we'll squeeze them and we'll choke them and we'll like burn them." And like, it's it's so it's so ridiculous. It's it's a joke, right? And so when you when you actually try, sometimes you try to help people to see how how silly it is. You know they they'll they'll make they'll make fun they'll attack yeah them. You know, this just is dumb. quickly over that like he was making fun of it that oh why do they talk about chickens and food and stuff right well why do the quran talk about the teen and the fig the olive and the branch or start swearing by random cities just like this in the sewer then uh there's another one where why does it repeat uh knock a knocking the quran is full of phrases vino a winnowing blow a blowing crack a crack and shake a shaking so these are actually so the way it was set up was a parody quite like i'll just read some words like from the quran you'll see dakkan dakka ki du ke da safan safa right you know line upon line destruction so when you do this this surah actually demonstrated the quran as a parody very beautifully um but yeah there's a few words on that <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right so the last slide that we left off on uh, had to do with evil eye and we we talked about like how ridiculous this is and how silly this is and so we won't we won't repeat that we'll go to the next one uh like <laughs> oh no, do you want to do you want to talk about the the backstory of this uh breastfeeding adults thing so long story short there used to be a guy as we can see um whose name uh, was sorry this lady sahla came to the prophet and uh said, O Messenger of Allah, I see signs of displeasure in this face of Abu Hudayfa when Salim enter upon me. So Abu Hudayfa is her husband and Salim is this child. The Prophet said, breastfeed him. And then the lady's like, how can I breastfeed him when he's a grown man? So when Muhammad said breastfeed him, the lady's first instinct is like, what you mean like, what? And she's confused. The Messenger of Allah then smiled and said, I know that he's a grown man, like a very naughty, kinky smile. So she did that. <laughs> so she did that. Then she came to the prophet and said, I have never seen any signs of displeasure on the after that. So, I mean, okay, so the guy apparently you feel is gonna be horny towards you. So the way to fix it is make him suck your tit. <laughs> or make him <laughs> but then even the second part doesn't make any sense. Like after that, he suddenly his husband's not jealous anymore. Oh no, she's not gonna cheat on me with uh, Salim. Is it Salim or Salim? Yes. <laughs> Salim, right? He's not going to cheat on me because he already sucked to the bed. What? Like... <laughs> What's funny I, is I... Aisha took this as a precedent for all men that she wanted to see that are not on mahram. She can make them like this. So there's a hadith where she started asking her other sisters who were lactating to call all the men to go breastfeed. <laughs> <laughs> breastfeed in her 404. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm uh did they but did they mean to express the milk like in a bottle or something? They don't mean literally like yes, talking. so that that's another controversy. Some scholars said that it was to put it in a cup and then give it to the kid. Okay, the like, adult, well, not that, kid, yeah. not kid. Yeah, yeah. adult, sorry, but like yeah. what's the it, point with that does that change? It's like, so complex for no reason. So then Albani, Sheikh Albani, uh said no, it actually means literally sucking from the tip. And then there was this huge controversy on Twitter recently with our beloved uh, Muhammad Hijab, the guy with the most modest name. He has hijab in his name, you know, like, and he's, <laughs> he's talking about. And then there was a huge controversy where people are saying, well, how can the Prophet say this? And why is Sheikh Albani saying that grown men can suck on women's tits? And there was a fatwa, I remember, from I think Al Azhar or something, where if a woman wants to work in a company, where there's men around, she should breastfeed her co workers or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. It's, I, it, is, it is so weird. I never really got into this whole uh, breastfeeding issue in Islam. Although I looked about, I looked at so many things. I looked at so many embarrassing things, so many uh, nonsensical things within Islam. I feel like I kind of just. Uh, went around this whole breastfeeding thing because it sounded it sounds so absurd to me i still feel like wait this this, this can't be real like there, there must be there must be some catch to it there must be some weird some something to this right i mean i i almost like to me this is almost like as obscure even though this is in like one of the main collections of hadith 
it almost feels like it's uh, it's so obscure because nobody would ever do this in today's time. At least I would think so. Uh, what do you think, Gondo? Uh, I mean, this, this is what I... Mohammed Tijab came out and said to some some other yeah. Muslim guy. I said, uh, "Okay, can I suck your wife's tits?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something to that effect, right? I, I mean, I was just laughing when I saw that because he was um, he was giving them the same treatment he he used to give us, like you know, like those vulgar framings of like you know can i do this you know can you would you let your wife do this and that like he he's doing the same thing to the muslims and i was just like they're laughing and clapping i'm like there you guys go now you know what we had to deal with all this time right this is what we're dealing with. <laughs> so there's this one hadith where it's really funny where aisha takes this one incident and then projects it as a common theme or practice that should be maintained so here Ome salama said to aisha a young boy who was at the threshold of puberty comes to you so Aisha was hanging out with this kid or a guy who was about almost mature. And then she says, I don't like that he should come to you. So then Aisha suddenly said, don't you see in Allah's messenger a model for you? And she also said the wife of Abu Hadefa comes to me and he's a grown man. And there's something that rankles in the mind of that kid. Whereupon Allah's messenger said, suckle him. So Aisha used that incident from before as a projection to set this tradition of suckling any guy who wants to come see her to making him her mehram. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> what, what? I, I, I don't understand why Muslim society doesn't just solve the problem of mahram by just making opening uh, places where women just breastfeed everybody <laughs> so, so, they, so they can get rid of the whole the, the barriers of you know and what's <laughs> one other thing but I wanted to make sure about this controversy we don't miss out is these verses there were verses revealed about breastfeeding adults that makes you oh, haram man. for marriage. There were first 10 sucklings that made a haram, then it, it was reduced to five, and then the verses don't exist in the Quran. But this is uh, numerously reported in almost all the earliest literature, even up to Imam Malik's Muwatta. He said that people were reciting the verses at times as well. And I mean, these are in Sahih Muslim as well. Um, if you want to just add my screen, I can... So, yeah, so these are... Oh, sorry. Yeah, someone's saying these are obscure hadith, but no, they're not obscure hadith, right? I'll find some more of it. Right now, I just want to show you that this is yeah. in Sahih Muslim. I, I, I have to say, I do not think that it works like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do not think that by sucking on the tits of a woman, you will uh, stop having uh, sexual desires for her and thereby... Uh, well, it means to come. I but have to show you this one. Yeah, yeah. But how does I don't I still don't understand how how like you're not allowed to show <laughs> your you're not allowed to be how what, how do you do this when you can't be alone with a woman and you can't she like that's her aura. I don't get it. It's weird, right? Like you, it's you, so don't, you, don't you don't understand the wisdom of Islam. <laughs> I don't understand how you implement this. That's what I'm confused about. Do you have to like blindfold them so they can't see what they're sucking? <laughs> okay, so this one is you have legit. to lower your gaze, eh? Like, okay, hold on, let me share your screen again. This one is legit a uh, real life example that happened in Omar's time, and I was like, how did this? Like, how do people believe this? So, this is from Imam Malik's Muatta, one of the earliest hadith collections, one of the strongest ones and authentic ones per Muslim uh, corpus. Here it says that Yahya related me from Malik. A man came to Abdullah ibn Omar, where judgments were being given. And he asked about the suckling of an older person. Abdullah ibn Omar replied, A man came to Omar ibn al-Khattab and said, I have a slave girl and I used to have intercourse with her. My wife went to her and suckled her. <laughs> when I, oh, went, to, when I, I went, when I went to the girl, my wife told me to watch out because she <laughs> had suckled her. So Omar told him to beat his wife and then go to his slave girl because kinship was only established by suckling of the young. Dude, what? <laughs> <laughs> you just contradicted the other hadith? <laughs> I mean, just trying to make sense of this. This is, this is, this is such a mess, man. I don't know. <laughs> it's like a TV series. You can make an anime out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta yeah, be careful. I suckled that one. It's like... <laughs> this is, um, I mean, we, we highlighted this before, but just kind of, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on this because it, it is actually quite comical. The wife of, um, was it Ibn Omar? Was jealous. Was it Ibn Omar's wife? Sorry, I'm trying no, to... Oh, it was a man. Some... A man came to yeah. Omar. Okay, so basically it was, a, it was some random person that his wife was jealous that he was screwing his slave and she didn't like it 
<laughs> so her her fix was within the Islamic framework to make that child her I sorry make that slave her daughter by suckling her, right? <laughs> and therefore now she's now that that slave is now like his daughter. But th- that means his his basically he's his daughter is a slave. Like it doesn't even make none of this makes any none sense. Of it makes. <laughs> it's so contradictory from every. I angle. give I give props to that lady's creativity to think this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> have you guys seen that like uh someone someone posted on ex muslim reddit the halal workaround to having a girlfriend boyfriend where you like you take your the, the lady as your slave and then you free her and then she becomes like your your wife or something there's like this big workaround you can do to have like premarital sex in islam without actually marrying the woman Dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it, 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 will, it would technically not work within Islamic within the Islamic legal system because you're not technically allowed to, uh, out of nowhere, enslave a free person. Oh yeah, 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 true. Yeah, you need yeah, a war. That's the that's the problem. Right? Yeah, you, know, you have to go to war and then enslave the enemy. Or, and, or you have to find a slave market. That's yeah, yeah, and buy yeah, slaves yeah. that are already slaves. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is again the last thing I'm going to share about the breastfeeding <laughs> thing. Then we'll move over from it. But this yeah. one's uh, hilarious. So this is again from uh, Imam Malik Smawata. <laughs> I'll zoom in quickly for you guys. And here, what we're looking at is the same incident being narrated, but then Imam Malik has some commentary and some other women saying this. So, uh, she gave him a few drinks. Aisha. Um al Mu'minin took that as a precedent for whatever men she wanted to be able to come see her. So I'm not saying this. This is in the Islamic hadith that Aisha was thinking that you can start breastfeeding any man you want to make your mahram. How does this work? I'm so confused. <laughs> so she ordered her sister to make a soup <laughs> and the daughters of her brother to give milk to whichever man she wanted to be able to come in to see her. I don't, I, I, I don't see the confusion in Abdullah Samir's face. He's like genuinely struggling to understand. Like, <laughs> I don't understand. So, I'm so lost. Like, how? What, what's going on? Like, so how other, does it square with Islamic modesty and strict segregation and no pre middle sex? Like, <laughs> I'm so lost. And like, I don't get it. Like, was this actually happening? Yeah, and then the other wives were literally mad and they're like, no way, that was just an exception for that one guy. So that also shows that that one guy was not a like a, into the cup feeding. He was a literal feeding. And Aisha took that as a precedent, sending random men to her sister to go suck my sister's titty. <laughs> but it says, it actually, like the like all the hadith is showing say suckling. It doesn't say express or milk drink. It says yeah. suckling. So, I don't exactly. know if the translation is bad, but that's clear what it means. I think we have to go to some Islamic scholars together and have to ask them to demonstrate to us <laughs> right. how this works. And, that's that's and, what Mama Hijab was, I think, trying to argue, right? Isn't it? Like exactly. Uh, like how would right. you, can you please show us how this works? <laughs> well, he Wait. was saying he was he was so these. I think what happened was the Islamic scholar was a Muslim scholar was defending it, and he was like, "Okay, well." prove your point like you know yeah <laughs> okay, can, okay can i suck your wife's tits to make her my mahram i think that's what he said to him Some, then... I, I don't know if he said can i or would you something like you know you should I, let her do that or something right i'm pretty sure he said can i i think i have oh. a screenshot here somewhere because i used it <laughs> uh, wait so so saying hey you, you want to suck my titties it's uh, like a sunnah <laughs> 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 oh my god i don't understand this i'm just like i'm so lost because as a muslim i like i never heard any of this <clears throat> i mean i read it but i didn't ponder oh. on it oh here here let me let me just let me, bring, okay. let me bring this up here uh share my screen <laughs> here oh my god <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Can I suck your wife's tit to make her mahram? I love how he capitalized it all. <laughs> <laughs> he took a page right out of Aisha's book. <laughs> okay, can I suck your wife's tit to make her mahram? So he's arguing against it basically. Like he thinks yeah, it's not yeah. allowed, right? Yeah, he, he says it's it's absurd. It should not be uh, what these Islamic what what, what scholars like uh, Albani teach. It is it is, it, 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 it is absurd to him, and he's challenging them to uh, to think about the logic of that. But of course, their reaction is like, "What the hell is going on with you?" <laughs> so this this Omar Chatlia, I think, because he's a scholar. I mean, Muhammad Hijab was forced to apologize to him, right? 
Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, they basically well, blamed it on the men. <laughs> they basically compelled him to to apologize and to get off Twitter. He hasn't been on Twitter since after this incident. He apologized, left Twitter, and he he didn't come back after that. And he <laughs> also said that he uh, he said, "I apologize. I am currently taking some heavy medication because I have back pain or something Tramadol. like that." And yes. this is and, the, <laughs> and and that medication makes me say very strange things in public and private. Uh, and he blamed it on the med and on the medicine, which is just so dumb. It's. <sighs> <laughs> yes, obviously his personality and style yeah, to be yeah. very, um, oh, I don't know what the word is, vulgar yeah. and uh, yeah. in your face sort right. of tactics. Eh? Right now that we're talking about Muhammad Hijab, I have to show you another thing that I came across. And this is ties into the golden shower thing. And I was shocked to find this myself. I'm like, holy shit, how does this even exist? I'm just trying to go on my Facebook. Perfect. And this is about, okay, I'm going to phrase it. Sahabas were vampires. They would drink blood. And they're not just vampires, blood. They were urine drinking blood vampires. So I'm going to quickly. <laughs> I'm going to quickly share my screen from my Facebook. And I had this post a few days ago. And I was even shocked. Like, this is what blew my mind. I like, completely blew my mind. Is in we've heard of those people drinking his spit and rubbing his spit infested stuff. So if you go to this link here, Islam Web. Okay, Islamic website. Question, the authenticity of the hadith stating that people drank the urine and blood of the prophet. Yeah. It, does, <laughs> what the, what WTF is what you're going to say, right? And it says it's one day Muhammad had cupping them to him and this one guy came and he's about, he, Muhammad said, go throw out the blood. But the guy took the blood and drank it. And then Muhammad yeah. learned about this. You want to explain what cupping is? Cupping is, you know, you put these uh, cups on your skin and you make a puncture mark. So it kind of sucks some blood out. Hijama, uh, like, so it's very popular in Middle Eastern and some athletes do it too. But uh, the evidence for that to help is not that conclusive scientifically. But it's an old kind of like treatment that's been used for thousands of years. Kind of like a homeopathic treatment. It's yeah, super it's clean the, yeah, clean the blood kind of thing. So in another narration, the Prophet supplicated to Allah for, uh, for him not to be touched by this hellfire and wiped his head. So this guy who drank Muhammad's blood, Muhammad validates the act by praying for him and telling him he won't go to hell. And then it's reported by Dara Kutni, Al-Hakim, and all these names. And Al-Haythami, Rahimahumullah, he says, consider the chain of narrators of this hadith to be a sahih one, and the other has graded as Hassan, so it's sound. So it's a sound narration. Moving on to the next one. Another one that the Prophet was... He was urinating in a container that would be under his bed. This is a very common practice in the middle and the dark ages as well, back in time. He didn't want to get up at night again and again. When he asked his Abyssinian woman or slave servant, where is it? Because he found the container empty. She just told him that I drank your piss. <laughs> so, and then in another narration, uh, Ibn Juraj uh, reports that Muhammad actually prayed for this woman to have good health and whatnot. And there are a bunch of uh, these hadith. Now, what's funny is, is I'm going to go another Islamic site just for those who are curious. There's not one, there's not two. There's a bunch of them and they're authenticated by Imam Sayyuti, Tabrani, and they go into a whole detail. Anyways. There is, I have to say one thing to be uh, fair. There is some controversy around this. Like uh, I remember looking up um, Islam Q and A, which is uh, a very notorious website mm -hmm. for Islamic questions. Uh, but when you look up uh, this question on their website, they have a fatwa on this matter where they say that um, that this uh, that certain reports are sound, but that the conclusion cannot be true because drinking urine and drinking uh, blood is always haram, even if it belongs to the prophet. That's what they say, for example. But other sources like these say, well, the sources say otherwise, so therefore it seems like this is okay. So there is some disagreement among these uh, different Muslim Muslim sources, but uh, you will find these uh, crazy sources everywhere in the world of Islamic believers that say certain things like uh, that uh, the blood, the sweat, and the urine of the Prophet are holy and things like that. And I, and I heard that myself in real life when I was a Muslim in religious environments. So it is really strange. Yeah, I was, um, I think, 
I think this is not something that would affect Muslims' day to day lives anymore because obviously the Prophet's dead. <laughs> you know, you can't touch <laughs> the blood is, or whatever. To preserve his so hair is not a good point, right? <laughs> but yeah, you, you, right, in, in Sufi, in Sufi, um, yeah, here's a list of scholars um, Ibn al Hajar al Qalani, Imam Suyuti, Imam Ghazali, Ali Qari, Ibn Hibban, Al Haita. Haytani, al -Manab. There's so many scholars, actually, Islamic scholars that have said this. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is, uh, uh, Lidwan, this is what you call cognitive dissonance, because what do you yeah. do when you have two contradictory things? Like one is just like, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around how this adult breastfeeding thing works, because I, on one hand, it's haram to see a woman naked, obviously, like, like, I don't, it, it's not, it's not clicking in my mind. So as a Muslim, I'd just be like, you know, it's one of those memes with the red buttons, right? The two red buttons. It's like, w which one is it? Like, <laughs> you can't figure <laughs> it out because it's a contradiction, right? Well, this, this is how you do it, Abdullah. This is how you do it. Like, uh, the, the woman sits there, she gets ready, and then you go there and you're like, like the, okay, do you have it ready? Is your, is your breast ready? Where is it? Here. Okay. Okay. That, that's, that's, how you go. that's how you go there. Okay. I got it. I got it. <laughs> this is like a, that's like, how you go about it. be like a section on like a porn website or something. <laughs> <laughs> Adult breastfeeding. <laughs> <laughs> it's so strange uh, uh oh my god uh, uh, yeah, geez. yeah 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 it's really strange all the kind of stuff that we can get into when we talk about Islam. <laughs> should we continue with the slides yeah we can continue with the slides okay. yeah. <laughs> all right um i wanted to make a point before we continue actually um which i i missed i had in my notes to discuss about the free will uh, which is that, you know, we we're talking about free will and we we're talking about, you know, how this this seemingly contradiction in the Islamic scripture that says that Allah on one hand, you know, he's the one who, you know, guides and misguides, he honors and dishonors. So like on one hand, it seems like Allah is the one that's deciding. On the other hand, you have free will. And this is something that confused a lot of Muslims. Like a lot, a lot of Muslims get confused by this because I, I don't think you can rationally like solve this thing. It, it is a contradiction. Yeah. If, from my perspective, what I would say, what I would just add to that is that if free will is like, why is free will such a good thing that you would, okay. So according to Islamic theology, Allah decided it's it's so important that it's worth sending people to hell. If you are creating like a race of robots or something, right? And you're going to condemn them to eternal suffering. Like you have a virus that you inject in the consciousness that makes them suffer, whatever suffering means to them. Like, is that worth, how is that worth it? And the grand scale of things that, and, and we're talking about eternal suffering. So if you, any calculation you do, you know, the majority going to hell, you are a cruel, evil, nasty monster for doing this because you are sending more people to eternal suffering. So on on the whole, you are you are you're like a nasty piece of shit. Because why would you do that? What why is like in if you ask me, is free will? Would I rather just not have free will rather than potentially going to hell? I would say like, what's the point of it? Like why? Like it's it's unjust to do that. It's completely immoral to allow such a thing. You know. So here, here, you have this, here you have this thing. Uh, I, I thought about that so often. Like um, to make it very simple to look at, you just have uh, this. This is the creation. This is a path that splits in two. You are a human created, and you are right here at this point right now. Uh, think about it. Allah creates you. Allah is all knowing, almighty, and He is good, the highest good there is. Allah creates you, and before He even created you, before He planned anything, before He even intended to create you, He knew exactly because He is all knowing and almighty that if He did create you, you would eventually use your free will in the wrong way and end up going to hell where He would punish you forever because you misused your free will you use your free will in the wrong way despite that he did create you and put you here and as a result of him creating you as a result of him creating uh the world the life the hell the punishment and creating you he condemned you to eternal hellfire forever now you can argue that you have free will supposedly that is the teaching you have free will and allah gave you free will he gave you the free will to choose but it does not matter you can always Go back again and say, okay, you have free will, but Allah knew exactly what you would do with that free will if he did 
designed you, if he did go ahead and create you, he knew exactly that you would misuse that free will and take the left path and go to hell and go and burn there forever. And you, you can again say, but yeah, he gave you free will. Well, okay, yes, he did. But he knew exactly that if he gave you free will, you would eventually use that free will in the wrong way and go to hell. So, and, and, and uh, this is just one example. We have to think if Allah creates life and death, the test and the afterlife and hell, then it is inevitable that millions, billions of humans will be subjected to this and will take the wrong path because of their free will, which Allah created knowingly and will go to hell and burn there forever. So Allah knowingly and willingly created an entire uh, species, an entire, he created billions of people so they burn in hell forever, just so he could also create some people who would worship him forever. Think about the absurdity of that. Think about how messed up that is for a second. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, honestly, the hell issue is something that there is no real fix for it. Because I know a lot of Muslims, the, the best fix that they come up with is basically that most non-Muslims are not kafirs. That's the best. Of course, this is not really in line with Islamic theology because you're saying nobody's kafir. And it, it creates another absurdity. Like the Hamza Yusuf, you know, uh, there is no kafir. It makes no sense too because... How would like the? How can anyone? Let's be let's be honest. How can anyone know it's true and still reject it? Like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's what he's saying. He's saying a kafir is someone that knows it's true, like actually knows, actually believes in Allah. Like kind of like the the archetype typical uh, typical Satan. Satan knows Allah is real, yet he still refuses to obey Allah. Like he sees he sees Allah, he knows Allah is real, and he still he's saying that's the real kafir. I'm sorry, but such like, a person does not exist unless he's... How can such a person exist? If you know hell is real and you don't... And you still reject it, you're just crazy. Yeah. You're you're broken. You're not... You're, you're human, your intellect is not functioning because, you know, you, we, we've we evolved. I mean, there's no such thing as evolved in Islam, but we, we have pain avoidance. We have survival tendencies for a reason. So that's, that's what Islam tries to use against us. It tries to use a, a fear of uh, suffering to make us submit to you know this false idea right eh? yeah yeah even if i was completely selfish even if i completely just looked out for my own good it would be the dumbest idea ever to uh know that hell exists that i will go to hell and then to choose to disbelieve and go to hell i mean even if it was even if i was a selfish uh pig it would be the dumbest thing to do to go to hell, you know. But you why are. Would I, why would I do that? <laughs> you are a selfish pig talking about Islam all day. How dare you? <laughs> but the thing is, um, yeah, like, like honestly speaking, I, it was the same sort of concern I had when I left Islam. Like, okay, I'm just gonna keep it to myself because I don't want my. Okay, I'm gonna take a risk for myself, but I'm not gonna misguide my kids. I don't want my kids to go to hell. Like, you know, you you worry about your own kids more than you worry about yourself if you're like a normal parent. Mm -hmm. That's just, again, how we evolved. You want your, <laughs> as to, make, to make, put it bluntly, you want your genes to be passed on because if you didn't, you wouldn't exist because your parents wouldn't have given a shit about you either. We yeah. all give shits because that's how we, you know, that's how the species continues. So I don't want my kids to suffer. I don't want my wife to suffer. So I wanted to look into it. But now, like, yeah, it's so obviously false, right? Um, Abdullah, you wanted to share, uh, Gondal, you wanted to share something? Yeah, One so thing? I came across when talking about the contradictory, weird, immodest, modest thing with the, the Islamic theology. So there was this idea that you've probably heard that slave women used to be bare-breasted to differentiate yes. them from free women, right? Now, mostly you'll come across that, okay, we don't know, we don't know. But I actually came across this statement on this Islam website. And this guy actually asked the same question where Imam, Ma, uh, this guy, he said, Imam Malik bin Anas strongly disapproved the behavior of slave women. And he actually said this to the Sultan. He escalated that they should have their titties exposed to the Sultan, right? So then this guy goes on like, no, no, no. But then they ask that <clears throat> this does not contradict the fact that during the lifetime, the generation followed the tubbies. So maybe the tubbies, those pious generations, were having these women walking around naked. Then he says, if you mean the authenticity of attributing it to Imam Malik, then it is authentically attributed to him. And then he goes on, who listened and who passed it on? Point being is that if an Imam Malik-like scholar of that caliber can be asking stuff like this to be done, shows how lopsided and how 
stupidly confused the theology is where you're covering the women and you want to put them in hijab but then you have breast adult feeding and then you have slaves walking around bare chested and whatnot it none of it makes sense <laughs> yeah it's a nice image but it's probably it's not it's not good yeah yeah so this is um this is something that i remember shocked me as a muslim yeah that i had uh hizb tahrir so this is a funny thing about hizb tahrir because of this hizb tahrir considers pornography halal i mean because of what? this and other really? reasons what? yeah 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 hizb tahrir in the official fatwa unless unless you changed it now but when i was in in islam muslim they consider it's an image and and when i was arguing with one muslim guy about this he's like don't you know the companion the slave women used to go around bare chested in medina i'm like wait what <laughs> again it was like one of those moments that i'm like how what like that doesn't make sense right uh, like and 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 apparently like this is true the, the slave women uh, now this fatwa is arguing this is not the case <laughs> but imam malik says it was the case <laughs> what, what is imam malik know? who is he who is this imam malik I, who is this yeah yeah i never heard of no imam malik. <laughs> <laughs> what i find very interesting is uh is uh, one, one of those things that uh when you go into the topic of the hijab i made a video about this about the origin of the hijab uh and if you read the tafsirs the early tafsirs about uh how the hijab came into existence and how basically uh umar was disturbed by uh the wives of the prophet just going to their to the toilet without covering themselves without hiding themselves and he was disturbed and he kept bugging muhammad about this he was like hey tell the women to cover up and all that and it's it's a completely absurd story where muhammad is like yeah just come on leave me alone man leave me alone and in the end he's like okay yeah okay allah revealed uh, that the women should cover up and <laughs> but uh in in the tafsir in ibn Kathir Tafsir, when he describes this stuff, he says, if I'm not uh, mistaken, he says that um, that the women were the, the Muslim women were to cover up so that they can be uh, distinguished from uh, the disbelievers and the prostitutes or something like that. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Quran says that actually, literally, that where say keep your wives home so they don't get molested. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's very strange. Oh, and when he married, uh, what was that? The daughter of the chief of Khaybar, I think Safiya, right? He exchanged her for seven slaves. And then the people were confused if she's going to be his slave or wife. So they were waiting if he's going to put the veil on her or not. So if the veil was <laughs> yeah, not yeah. on, she wouldn't have been his wife, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, this is true, too, that there's um, like what AP was saying, that there's um, there's some classism in the hijab. Like it, it was considered like... You know the 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 slaves went around probably according to imam malik and others bare chested this was a sign of you, you know it, it contradicts with the idea that i don't know to me as a muslim i was i was like i don't i like it seemed very unjust it seemed very degrading i mean it's not seems it is degrading to a woman to have to go through that which woman wants to go around bare chested in a society well, you're not bare chested. I'm not talking about in Africa where everybody does that. I mean, okay, like some some tribes in Africa, that's the norm. We're talking about to humiliate you, you're gonna you're gonna make them walk around with with the chest showing. I mean, that's not right, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Next. Uh, okay, so should we go back to the slides? Yeah. Uh, Maybe I'm just gonna read the, the super chats quickly. There's a couple of yeah. super chats. Uh, according to the New Testament studies, this is from Stop Scamming Man. Uh, has seven books posted. Da -da. They didn't believe. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is awesome. But Ehrman is honestly, when I started studying But Ehrman, like his content and reading his books, I it made Islam. I, I don't understand how Muslims can be fans of But Ehrman because <laughs> it, it makes Islam look worse. Like when you study what he says, because like the early Christians, early the Jews didn't believe in hell. They didn't believe in the the Jews allow alcohol like kosher alcohol like none of this seems to be the same religion like it's supposed to be according to Islam it's all the same religion, but like you see these ideas gradually evolve right, and I know many Christians would disagree with this idea of low Christology versus high Christology, and how you know in in Mark there's what 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 you know he calls low Christology which is that Jesus became God at you know when he died basically right he was raised to heaven when he died but then by john he's he's god in the beginning he's with god right so it you can see this evolution of 
you know, high and high Christology. Now, of course, Christians have the, you know, the the responses to that where they say, no, 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 it's it's always the same Christology. All the gospels say the same thing. But like, you know, he's looking at it from a different perspective. From his perspective, and you know, I agree, you see that when the virgin birth comes, I forget whether whether it was Luke and Matthew, it's in the middle. That's when you know, that's where Muhammad took it from. He took he took basically not the earliest ideas, but something that evolved in Christianity, whatever I guess he heard, and he made that part of Islam. So, you know, I do think this is, you know, but Ehrman is is a gem, you know, like studying him, it, it just gives a lot, so it gives a lot more perspective on Islam, in my opinion. It just, it shows, you know, I unfortunately, he doesn't make comments on Islam itself. I would love it for him to say, Islam has problems in its preservation and you know like the way he does with the Bible I think you know he doesn't want to get cancelled maybe I don't know he's he has at some points actually now been a little bit more upfront and said things against you know the, the Quran's preservation being true but um on his blog and it's you know it's close to members only and it's not like he's going on YouTube and saying it but anyways, you know it's not a special thing I actually had some communication with Bart Ehrman I actually oh, yeah. uh, actually uh, texted with him um, a, a, a while back and was thinking about inviting him onto my channel uh, maybe even having an in-person uh, discussion interview I was just thinking uh, I couldn't really decide what exactly I should uh, <laughs> do, do with him what exactly I should talk about with him and I was thinking maybe I could devise something that would connect the goal of my channel which is uh, you know the whole Islam analysis with his work and his criticism of of Christianity uh, and if I can come up with something I would like to invite him because he, he told me he would he would appear on the channel um but yeah well, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking about that we could actually i could actually do that i think it's a great idea um like i said my when i've been re the stuff i read actually made me even more confident that islam is false because uh -huh. you can see the evolution of the theology so maybe you know that'd be something worth talking about uh hi ap any thoughts on having the vids dubbed into say indonesian urdu and malay uh I, I got these questions forever since the beginning of my channel. I just I just don't know how I am how how I'm supposed to take care of that. It's, yeah. it's, uh, I'm not very I'm not a very organized person. I'm an extremely disorganized individual. It's very hard for me to take care of uh, my scheduled videos. So it would be uh, extremely hard for me to also take care of uh, subtitling all of my videos in different languages and employing people who sub who subtitle those videos. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So this was uh this was quite the topic, eh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> just one point before we go forward. Yep. Uh, in the comments, I noticed that they were saying that Imam Malik denounced the bare-chested practice. What I was trying to convey, if I wasn't clear, was he mentioned that the women used to do that in that time, and that he was pissed off that they were doing that. And that quote is authentic. That means that's being used as evidence to show that the Tabis did in fact have this happening in their time. That was the whole point. If that was a little confusing, uh, just clearing that up. <clears throat> All right, next slide. Jonah gets swallowed by a whale. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a recent story that happened where a diver got swallowed by uh, like a whale and he got spat out at the shore. He wasn't yeah. in there for three days though, was he? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she has a video. Say, does it say how long he was in there? Uh, yeah, for uh, for Jonah, I believe in the hadith and everything. It says he was in there for three days, and then he prayed in the belly of the whale. Uh, what's that word they say? There's a special prayer of Jonah that he said. Oh, I forgot it. They say it when people die, and they repeat a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's I can't remember it either. I lost it. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, similar okay. to that. Oh, the, f the famous one. This one has caused oh, so much controversy. <laughs> he was created from a fluid ejected. You, uh, you know what's so funny about this about this uh, thing? Semen from backbones and ribs. I had a you know I had this uh, this debate with uh, Nader Ahmed the first time that I had a, <laughs> a had a science debate with him, and. Uh, we were basically arguing how the Quran is full of scientific mistakes, and I was—he uh, kept wanting, he kept uh, 
pushing me to bring up this scientific mistake. And I'm like, hey, I don't want to talk about this. I don't care. <laughs> no, I want to talk about other things. And he's like, no, ask me about the Siemens from back. Then. I'm like, okay, fine, fine, let's do it. Let's talk about it. And then <laughs> what, uh, what he brings up is that, uh, that the human body, when you actually look at the human body from the bottom, then uh, the place where the semen originates is actually between the backbones and ribs. And so, <laughs> so when you look at it from this angle, then it is actually true that it comes from from uh, a region that can be described as between the backbones and ribs. So therefore, the Quran is miraculous and accurate. And oh. <laughs> it's, it's so dumb. Oh, <laughs> my God. It is not even accurate. But his entire idea to resort to that, to instead of taking this exactly as it says, to just look at a, at an x-ray and say, hey, look, if you, if you look from this angle, yeah. then it does look like it comes from between the between the backbones. It's so dumb. I don't like bringing this topic up either because, honestly, it's it's like a dead horse that's been flogged to death. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and the Muslim apologists have built up all of these excuses for it. So it's just not... You know, there's so many other things, I think. I mean, this is this is a clear problem in the Quran. And frankly speaking, if you can't see this is false from this one thing, like we can't help, there's nothing to help yeah. you. This yeah. is like obviously a mistake. The, yeah, I feel you like know, right? a, a, a rule where like the more problematic a Quranic verse is, the more complex it's to see this. That's a good one because, you know, there's this... um. I forgot his name now, but there's this guy that was on the Flat Earth documentary on Netflix. By the way, it's called Beyond the Curve. I highly recommend everyone watches it. And he actually mentioned, um, I think his name is Tim, that the more crazy the conspiracy theory, the the more con like sorry, the more flawed like the 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 um, the idea is like for example, Flat Earth. The more convoluted the workarounds have to be to make it fit into reality. Right, like yeah. the harder you have to work to make it make sense, obviously, right? I guess because it doesn't fit, right? <laughs> well, I, I, are you saying that the Earth is not flat? <laughs> <laughs> it's not flat. So well, the whole it, idea is the flat Earth in the Quran. <laughs> like the yeah. flat Earth in the Quran, I think appeals to Salafis. I, I mean, a major minority of Salafis do ex believe in flat Earth because otherwise. A lot of these things just don't make sense, like Allah coming down to the lowest heaven every night. How do, you make sense? How do you make sense with Allah coming down if it's not a flat earth? You can't no, come down it, to every different place. The earth is flat, but Allah is so heavy, <laughs> he morphs in the geometry of space time to make it circular. <laughs> oh man, I never heard that before. You make a good apologist. <laughs> if the earth is not flat, if the earth is round, then that means that ships go like this on on the side of the earth. And that, <laughs> and, and that can't be real. That can't be What's, true. I was actually shocked that the founder of the Bareilly School of Thought, Imam Ahmad al Khan, wrote a book where like he had like a hundred points where he had graphs and like diagrams, force diagrams equations trying to disprove that the earth is flat and like his logic was if it was circular the water would spin off the sides <laughs> <laughs> oh, and i'm like uh, yeah. but yeah I, it's, so yeah it's back hard. to the slides uh see my, okay so next one Oh, yeah. So this one always got me like, this is just bizarre. Like a tree whose fruits are like the heads of Satan. And uh, Muhammad mentioned this quite a few times in the Quran. And he says, uh, indeed, there's a tree issuing from the bottom of the hellfire. Its emerging fruit is as its heads of the devils. And they will eat from it and fill their bellies. Now, I don't understand. How does a tree keep growing in this immense heat and not burn? What is it made out of? Then secondly, what kind of fruit are you looking at? Like spiky, thorny fruit, and like, like who? Brother, the physics, the physics of hellfire are different from the physics of this eternal, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, as, sphere of existence. As, yeah. as <laughs> Sheikh Molana Yasser Al Qadi put it, it is supra rational. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the jinns will also go and burn in the hellfire. The jinns uh, are of smokeless fire, and they will go and burn in the hellfire. And it just, it just you cannot you cannot grasp the physics of it. It's just yes, different. but but Islamic scholars have an answer. You see, 
in the hadith, the, the Prophet said that he felt the coolness of the spittle of the jinn. So therefore, the oh. jinns are made of fire, but they are not fire. Oh, yeah. 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 And, then, yeah. and then hell, hell has like different types of fire because the breath of hell makes the cold, and then also the breath in the summer makes it hot. <laughs> See, Islam has all the answers. You're just doubters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> This one was just weird. Like, so this go ties in with uh, a lot of other hadith where Muhammad said the sun rises and sets between the horns of Satan, and he also forbid like praying right before sunset or uh, sorry and sunrise, something like yes. that. Oh and yeah, that's that's that's, a, that's the thing. You cannot pray at that time. It's I like, remember yeah. this really confused me as a Muslim. I was like, yeah, what same. The heck. Same. Same, 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 same. Well, like, when I, when I started mean? praying and I, and, I, and I learned the exact rules about it. You can't like, pray at specific times. And I, 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 my <laughs> guess is there must have been some religious group that did this and worshipped the sun. Yeah. That's yeah, the only yeah. thing I can come up with that makes yeah. sense. I think there was such an explanation. I remember something along those lines. Yeah. It's just weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rises between the horns of Satan. I guess that's probably an expression. Yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah. The, I'm reading a fatwa about this, and it mm -hmm. says some of the, that is exactly as it is in the wording that the Satan has horns and it carries <laughs> the sun out. Like, I'll share the screen. I mean, it's from Islam web as well. But uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Some interpreters of the narration defer regarding the meaning of the horn of Satan. Some said that the meaning is exactly as in the wording that the sun rises on the horn of Satan or between the two horns. This cannot be questioned. It's a matter of the unseen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't care if you're worshiping Allah. Why does it matter when the yeah. sun rises? I mean, <laughs> I mean it's it's, it rises in the horns and it sets in a pond. <laughs> 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 Yo, this guy was a wackadoodle dude. It's so weird, right? <laughs> You, you know how Islam has all these things, these these extremely strict rules about, uh, you know, the, the the symbolism of things. How you're not supposed to bow down in front of certain things. You, know, you your prayer is interrupted and invalid if something passes in front of you, and all this stuff. It's it's just so weird. Like these. And then about to very, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just a bunch of very strange rules. Like why why can't you just shut the hell up and just you know worship Allah if that's what you're doing instead of worrying about all the I don't know washing yourself in this way and that way and praying in this way and that way saying certain words having your praise invalidated if you accidentally fart. I mean seriously, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really it's really strange. So with the with the sunset one, I just want to quickly show you that these hadith are authentic. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me yeah. share screen one second. Okay, go ahead. So this is actually from uh, Sahih Hadith from Jami as -Sagid, And it literally, it's classified fully authentic. It says, uh, where does the sun set? Muhammad asked the companion and he doesn't, I don't know. And Muhammad then explicitly says that it says in a pond of warm water, like straight up. Okay, this uh -huh. is uh, Albani's book, I think. And... This is the verse that they're talking about. And the hadith actually uses the same wording in the Quranic verse. Wait, hold Hamid. on a second. Are we, are we talking about a crowd of people seen covering the sky? Oh, no, no. This is about the horns of Satan. I just wanted to... Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. I moved the ahead point. too fast. Okay, okay. Go go back. So you were saying, okay? Is so is this okay? is the hadith that is sahih where Muhammad is affirming the literal setting of the sun in the pond. Okay, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And... Then, I mean, this is from uh, Sahih al-Isnad by Atandika al-Albani. This is from Abu Dawud. It's another book. Uh, and this, again, it says, Muhammad is riding a donkey. <laughs> Remember, the donkey is the worst sound. Allah hates the sound of the donkey, but Muhammad loves riding it for some reason. He says, asks his buddy, where does the sun set? Do you know? And the guy's like, I don't know. Allah knows best and his prophet. And Muhammad said, it sets in a spring of warm water. You know what's funny? Um, when you bring up the, the, this hadith, uh, certain Muslim apologists say that uh, that this hadith is not entirely accurate. That's that's what they say, what they claim, because there are uh, other hadith that in a higher number that narrate the same story, but don't narrate that part in which Muhammad says that the sun sets in a muddy spring, but uh, in which Muhammad simply says uh, that the sun goes to uh, prostrate under the throne of Allah and asks uh, to rise again, and Allah gives the sun permission, so also the yeah. sun rises again. And one day, the sun will not be given permission, and then it will go and rise from the west. And that is when mm -hmm. the day of judgment will come. And it's like, no matter what, which story, no matter which hadith you take, as, as the as the real deal it is just stupidly absurd 
<laughs> this I, one, yep. Here, he's kind of merged all of them together. So he's starting like in in the Urdu translation. I can read. He says that uh, the sun goes into the pond and then it goes under the throne. <laughs> to mm. prostrate to Allah and then ask if it can come out again. <laughs> so, so again, um, this is you know, like this. This just gives more and more confluence to the idea that Muhammad had no clue about anything. Like Allah has no clue about anything because it's not just a hadith. It's the Quran as well is using the same language that yeah. is alluded to in the hadith. The hadith goes into more detail. If you want to throw out the hadith, okay, throw out the hadith, but then you still have the problems in the Quran, right? You know what I mean? Like the, the, the problems in the Quran, the, all, all the statements in the Quran are very geocentric. It's very much a model of a flat earth, you know, with the sun going in a circle around it. You know what I'm saying? Allah coming Allah coming down to the lowest heaven is in the Hadith as well. But it you, you would have to probably throw out all of these Hadith in the modern world because it's just like that's the only way to save the Quran now, right? Because the yeah. Quran is a little bit more vague and you can kind of reinterpret it. But for those of us who actually care about what Sunni Islam is teaching, this is what is this is this adds more confluence to a very flawed cosmology coming from the creator of the universe. Right? Like we expect better from the creator of the universe. That you know, I had this guy in his book actually tell me this guy that was debating with me when I left Islam. It wasn't Allah's goal to correct the, the flawed science of the seventh century, so he just let it let it be misunderstood. Like he added to the problems by by speaking in the flawed language. Like, at what point do you want to just admit that this is wrong? You, you know what I mean? It's like no, I mean, he was he was just he was just trolling them. Like what? Like. <laughs> I, it, it it takes some real absurdity, some real cognitive dissonance, some real, uh, I don't know, willful ignorance to see hadiths like this accompanied with Quran <laughs> verses that yeah. are so clear, undeniable. And you see very clearly in them that uh, that's neither the Quran's author nor Muhammad, who uh, I would I say is the same person, uh, had any idea about how the universe works. And they, they clearly say that the, that the sun goes somewhere at night. If you look at those hadiths, I mean, it, it is, it is, it should be a rule that if Muhammad asks a question, "Hey, do you know how this and this works?" and then the other person says, uh, "Allah and His Messenger know best," then you are, you are, you are to expect something very dumb after that, because then, then Muhammad starts making up some some very stupid stuff. It, it's but, so funny. He was at, he like he exposed himself by doing this. Yeah. It's like he wants to be smart. Hey guys, you want to know what happens when this and this? It's like Allah nobody asked you. Know best. Nobody, nobody even asked. Him, he's asking them to ask him. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like this is like extreme narcissist. Like, it's like I go to my kids, loading. hey guys, you want to know about this? Like, okay, with the kids, it's more understandable, but this guy is just like making up stuff <laughs> as he's going along. He wants to be like the smart, and of course, they preserved it. Thank, thanks to them, yeah. yeah um, yeah. You know, there, like, there, is, there is the other story. There is this thing. Yeah. Uh, he goes, he goes to his crowd, to his Muslims. No, they, they are sitting. They are sitting somewhere, and then they see a a shooting star, a meteor, and then he's like, yeah. "Hey guys, do you know what this means?" And they're like, "No, I'll let messenger know best." Like, well, let me tell you what this is. Is the jinns, you know, the jinns, the thing beings made of fire. Well, they go up sometimes. They go, they try to go up there to the high assembly of Allah, and they try to listen to the high assembly of Allah and try to, uh, to to catch, to snatch some secret information which nobody knows. And sometimes they actually manage to snatch secret information from Allah's high assembly. And then Allah's uh, angels notice that the, those jinns, and what they do is they immediately take those uh, fireballs, those missiles, and throw them at those jinns. And those missiles chase those jinns and destroy them. And that's what happens when you see those uh, shooting starts. Yeah, that's what that's, that's what happens, guys. And like, oh wow! Thank you for enlightening us. <laughs> I found yeah, the hadith he, he okay. just talked about. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you found the same one? Yeah. Exactly the same one. Yeah, yeah. He's like he's gloating. Like, look at that star. <laughs> oh. Let's let's read this. Who wants to read this? I think I'll let Apostle Prophet read it. There you go. Oh yeah. Can you so, see? Is it big enough? Yeah. Zoom in a little yeah. bit more. Okay, so this is narrated by by Ibn Abbas, yeah. Yeah. a very valuable 
person. <laughs> we were with the Messenger of Allah while he was sitting with a group of his companions when they saw a glowing shooting star. The Messenger of Allah said, when you saw the likes of this during Jahiliyyah, what would you say about it? They said, we would say that a great man died or that a great man has been born. The Messenger of Allah said, it is not shot due to the death of anyone, <laughs> nor his coming into life. No, no, no. Rather, when our Lord decrees a matter, he is glorified by the bearers of the throne. Then he is glorified by the inhabitants who are below them. Then those below them, until such glorification reaches this heaven. Then the inhabitants of the sixth heaven ask the inhabitants of the seventh heaven, what did you, Lord, say? He said, so they inform them. Then the inhabitants of each heaven seek the information until the news is conveyed to the inhabitants of the heavens of the earth. The shayateen, the devils, try to overhear. So they are shot at. So they cast it down to their friends. Whatever they came with is true as it is, but they distort it and add to it. What the hell, man? <laughs> oh my god <laughs> stop talking nonsense you guys are not medical doctors uh, notice the seven heavens there yeah the seven heavens oh, thing wow. is another big problem in islam that used to puzzle me as a muslim as well because it makes no sense see why is allah having so many redundant loops in the this the transfer points like why can't you transfer directly from one point to another why is it like <laughs> one <laughs> angel to another to another, to another? <laughs> and so, it creates this weird security loophole where when he's passing, the, it's like a, it's like a Wi-Fi connection that's not a <laughs> secure <laughs> without password. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Allah is yeah. bad internet. He's just, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um. I was gonna say like what you were saying, just to add to what you were saying, uh, this one, that the the hadith basically confirm, like you know the the hadith that says one. We talked about this in the last episode. There's not hadith, the Quran is worse that says one male witness was or two females. Uh -huh. Then you have a hadith that says, well, women are dumb. Yeah. So yeah. that just goes perfectly along with the Quran. I mean, meaning like, if you wonder why would Muhammad say that? Well, he told you why. Yeah. So you don't need to guess. The sun setting in a muddy pool, you know, that's okay. That doesn't make sense. Well, look at the hadith. The hadith explains. Well, it's going down and circle down the flat earth, right? And it's asking Allah's permission. I actually had a very smart friend. His wife went to Harvard. I think she was a convert, Egyptian friend, one of the guys who runs Quran.com. And um, he actually told me, how do you not understand this, this hadith? It's metaphysical about the sun, you know, setting and asking for permission and blah, blah, blah. And I said, no matter how you look at it, the sun is always in the sky in the same spot. Like there's no way to make sense out of this hadith because if it's setting, if it's doing, it's going and asking Allah for permission, but it's, it's, it's there in the same, like you can put a camera on the sun. It's there 24 seven. Now, if you want to make it into some metaphorical thing, that's totally up to you, but that's not how anyone understood it at that time. Right. It's just now you're making it more and more in, in, uh, and fall, you know, un, um, unfalsible. What, what's what? Unfal unfalsifiable. Unfalsifiable. Yeah. unfalsifiable. Basically you're making Islam unfalsifiable by saying, None of these things. So like the shooting stars thing, I don't usually use, I, I don't pick on that because again, it's uh, secrets of the unknown, but I the sun it. setting in a spring yeah. and you know, other coming, these things actually cause problems because they clash with the real world cosmology, the seven heavens. We can find out what the seven heavens meant. And by the way, but Ehrman, I learned this from him. And the funny thing is it was in a, actually it wasn't but Ehrman. It was uh, Nadir was debating with, I think Alan Ra, uh -huh. And he brought up the seven <laughs> heavens and, and Aaron Ra was like, seven heavens, yeah, like Saturn, Jupiter, Mercury, Mars, and Venus, and the moon or something, mm -hmm. right? The seven, that's the seven heavens. Like, that's exactly Plato's seven spheres. That's what uh -huh. ancient people used to believe in, the seven heavens. Yeah, It's it's clear as day. And then he, he explained it so beautifully that, okay, he, this is what, and he's not even, a, oh, no, no, it was Richard Carrier. Richard Carrier did this with, uh, I don't, uh, with uh, Nadir. And he said, okay, look, if the Quran, and he was using the example of the Bible, but it makes perfect sense with the Quran. If the Quran doesn't define a certain term, that means the people understand it already. Mm -hmm. It's You're not changing the meaning. So we look and see what did those people understand at that time? And that's exactly what they understood, the seven planets, yeah. right? Like the, the, the big ones. So at that case, um, you know, we can understand that like, like this is wrong. The Muslims today will now say it's seven universes. Okay, the first heaven is this entire universe, and then there's another universe. But like that's not what they understood it as, right? And yeah, so yeah. I thought it was the Quran, seven 
seven layers of the atmosphere. <laughs> uh, that, that's even worse because that's just stupid. There's not even seven. Yeah, because seven the, layers. the Quran says that the stars are in the nearest heaven. That wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. That that the, that alone um, blows that apart. I think Nadir tried to use that as well with me, and I'm like, no. The Quran says the the nearest heaven has stars as lamps or whatever. Eh? Um, mm -hmm. Gondal, how much time do you have left? Uh, like about 15 more minutes. And okay. Then wrap it up, yeah. So do you want to go, go back to the slides then? Or? Yeah, yeah. I, I want to add something very brief. I don't, I want to yep. go very long, but, uh, to, yep. to the whole thing, when you bring up the whole issue with the sun, uh, not moving anywhere and being right there, uh, what's very funny is I actually made a short video about this, about this stuff in which I challenged all Muslims and said, Hey, uh, Muhammad and the Quran clearly described that the sun goes somewhere, that it has a stopping point, that it goes into a puddle, that it goes to worship Allah at night and comes back in the morning and it will come back from a different direction and so on how can you possibly believe this when the sun does not go anywhere we revolve around the sun and uh, all that and and the sun is there at that same point and you know what the response was one muslim apologist made a response and said ha 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 so dumb the sun is not static the sun actually uh moves <laughs> around around the galaxy yeah and then and then they yeah. all forgot everything that that we said and said ha, ha 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 look so ignorant the sun actually moves around the galaxy ha ha okay it's closed and this the, is how it works that <laughs> response is comical to me because they're talking about a 300 million yeah, year yeah. orbit around the milky way galaxy yeah. around the super black hole that we have I don't how, know, is, that how, how is, is that related how is that relevant related? to you man yeah <laughs> i mean it's a joke right it's to actually say that's what the quran's talking about yeah clearly everybody thought the quran's talking about the sun and the moon yeah the orbit of the sun and the moon right like yeah. everybody yeah. it's so obvious right and yeah. obviously that's what muhammad thought now of course you can try to retwist it or whatever but reinterpret it <laughs> in a different way but it's not mm -hmm. it's not a plausible interpretation because it it's just like completely it's just completely out of out of yeah. place to anything yeah. right yeah yeah and yeah. then it always talks about sun and moon sun and moon yeah like there's and no the way sun, sun and moon chase each other they cannot uh catch up to each other they follow each other that's what the, the quran repeatedly says yep mm -hmm. okay so this was weird i i didn't really get this right so what is this going what's going on here uh gondol all right, let me just pull that up on my side. So I feel like what's going on here is that Muhammad was just standing there and he then told people that one day I was just chilling and I looked up and there were some nations were displayed before me in the sky. A prophet would pass in front of me with <laughs> one man and another with two men and then another with a group of people and then another with nobody with him. Then I saw a great crowd covering the horizon, and I wish that there, these were my followers. But it was said to me, this is Moses and his followers. Then it was said to me, look. And I looked, and I saw a big gathering with a large number of people covering the horizon. It was said, look this way and that way. So I saw a big crowd covering the horizon. Then it was said to me, these are your followers. And among them are 70,000 who will enter paradise without being questioned. Then the people dispersed and the prophet did not tell who those 70,000 were. Companions started talking about them as regards us. We were born heathenism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, they're confused. Oh my God, am I going to be the one that's amongst the lucky 70, 70 K? <laughs> you know, the, the, the cool, yeah, Islamic. <laughs> but like, this is just weird where this guy's just standing there and then it's just, just, it's like you know, he did some shrooms and he's just standing looking at the sky and he's seeing these images, or I don't know. <laughs> it's it's weird to admit to imagine that. <laughs> yeah, like this is like a uh, like a holographic show in the sky that you know only Muhammad can see and seventy thousand people worse. <laughs> yeah, that's weird, right? What, what so I, I genuinely believe that Muhammad had some mental problems. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I do not. I don't think that he was just an evil guy who made everything up. I think that he had some genuine mental problems, mm -hmm. which uh, encouraged encouraged him to uh, make up things. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jihadi gave. Yeah. <laughs> so this is interesting. Where and this happened a few times when the, uh, Allah's messenger returned on the day of Khandak, the trench battle. He put down his arms and took a bath. So Muhammad's like, "All right, our battle's over. Let's all go clean up." You know. Then Gabriel, whose head was covered with dust, came to him saying, You have put down your arms? By Allah, I have not put down my arms yet. Allah's messenger said, Where to now? Then Gabriel said, This way, pointing towards the Jews. <laughs> and they went towards them. And then 
Uh, rest is history where Muhammad slaughtered their 800 to 900 men and children who had uh, uh, pubic hair as a yeah. qualifier for beheading and the genocide of the whole tribe. But the precursor to that was this jihadi Gabriel apparition came to him <laughs> and convinced him to do it. This just, this just uh, makes me think again, mental problems. He fights a war, he goes home, and then he sees this this hallucination of the guy who says, hey, why are you putting your weapons down? We have more work to do. Let's go and behead those, behead that whole tribe. And yeah. he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. The other good thing about that one is it's not just, uh, just that this happened then with the Gabriel. It also happened a few other times too. And you'll see that Gabriel would pop up in the form of this guy named Diha Al-Kalbi, where people will be standing in front of Muhammad, like, that's your companion. We can see him. Everybody, he's the guy that we all know. And then Muhammad, like, no, that's Angel Gabriel. <laughs> so another version says that it was that guy who was talking to Muhammad, and Muhammad's wife was there, and she's like, fuck's going on? He's just a guy. <laughs> Muhammad says, no, it's an angel. And this is the Capgrass delusion syndrome, whatever it ties in nicely too, but yeah. It's just uh, just weird. And then angels fighting is like in the Battle of Badr. They won the battle for the Muslim. But then when they showed up in Ohad, ah, uh, shit, they didn't win the battle. They lost it. <laughs> right? Like, and then the, it's it's a weird when you think about how crazy the guy is. He's having angels sitting on here, angels writing your deeds, angels everywhere, angels throwing shooting stars at you, angels bringing revelation. It's angel a fairy him. Angel choking him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, He's wrestling yeah. an angel in the mosque. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Jin, uh, the genie. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, that was the kid. <laughs> He's wrestling with the devil. Or with that was the genie. Yeah. I think that's the next slide, yeah. yeah. Oh, is it? Uh, I think so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, I'm just gonna, I just want to yeah. hold on, hold on. I just want to point one thing out. Um, where is he? Where is he? Okay. Uh, you guys talking about hadith, there's something wrong who write hadith. If you guys have guts... Then talk about Quran. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about Quran too. Like, I mean, there's there's more content in the Hadith, but like, actually, a lot of these things refer to Quranic teachings. Like, for example, Satan, uh, the idea of devils, and all of that. The specifics, and this is actually quoting. Um, this is quoting the Quran. This Hadith. <laughs> <laughs> This hadith quotes yeah, yeah, yeah. the Quran, right? You, you, know, um, you know what's funny? The hadith are more authentic than the Quran. There is no reason for you to believe in the authenticity of the Quran if you do not trust the hadith. If you do not trust the hadith at all, then uh, with the Quran, all you have is a book that was delivered by some people, brought by some people, and that makes some very, very big, extraordinary claims. <laughs> you can yeah. only verify what the Quran is and why it says all the things that it says because you look at the hadith and the hadith explained to you how the Quran came into existence, how it was preserved, how it came into how it came to be the book that you have. If you do not trust the hadith, if you throw them out, then you don't, then you have nothing. You have no reason to trust the Quran at all. It's the same <laughs> process of preservation, yeah. Yeah. But it, in this hadith, it's just that Muhammad literally has like fist fighting, like UFC match with the, the genie, you know, when he's tackling him. And then eventually he says that Allah gave me an upper hand and I put a Satan in the chokehold. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know if he's getting the one back because, you know, Gabriel choked him. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to choke this. <laughs> What, 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 what's funny is no doubt I thought of tying him to one of the pillars of the mosque till he get up in the morning and see him but then I remembered the statement of Prophet Solomon my such Lord a nice guy yeah. Yeah. so wait I'm just picturing Muhammad has this imaginary devil in his arm <laughs> and he's dragging it to the pillar <laughs> I wanted to tie him up so you can all see him but then you know I didn't do it yeah so he's gone uh. <laughs> Okay, this one's good. Okay. Oh my god! Oh, I'll let I'll let AP read this one. Really? Do I really do nah, you want to? I'll do. You want me to do it? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, Samir, do it. Okay. What? Who? Samir? Okay, you do it. Yeah. Um. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm just gonna ignore the the first part about putting yeah. a cloak. Blah blah blah. Okay. I don't know why they mentioned that <laughs> about the cloak, which was perfumed, and there was a trace of yellowness on it. Why did anyone even <laughs> bother to? It's it's a skid mark, bro. <laughs> Uh, so there was a tr okay, whatever. About I don't care about your cloak, man. It has yellow yellowness on it. Whatever. Uh, he said to the prophet, holy prophet, do you, what do you command me to do during my umrah? 
it was at this juncture that the revelation came to the messenger of Allah and he was covered with a cloth, I guess the one with yellowness on it. And Yala said, would that I see revelation coming to the messenger of Allah? He, Hazrat, Hazrat Omar said, would it please you to see the messenger of Allah receiving the revelations? Omar lifted. The, so he was under the cloth. They lifted the cloth. Hey, guys, you want to see this? Big show, big show, come and see the prophet getting revelation extra. Okay. Oh, look, 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 there he is, eh? And Omar lifted the coin of the cloth and I looked at him and he was emitting a sound of snorting. He the then later said, I thought it was the sound of a camel. <laughs> when he was relieved of this, when he stopped snorting, he said, where is he who asked about Umrah? So the prophet's done snorting like a camel they un, you know, under his cloth. The person came, the prophet said, wash out the trace of yellowness. Oh yeah, wash off the perfume or whatever and uh, then do your Umrah. I think this is a case of where a guy just kind of like had a moist fart and he had an <laughs> <laughs> So we have, there's an interesting story to this. Uh, Abdullah Gondal and I were in a Facebook group called Speaker's Corner. It's called Speaker's Corner. And Gondal shared this hadith and they kicked us out of the group because he shared a hadith about Muhammad snorting like a camel. Okay, like we didn't make up the hadith. It's, just, it's embarrassing. Okay, Muslims might be embarrassed by that, but that's what it—that's what he was doing. It was like you know, spit was coming out of his mouth and snorting like a cow. Like, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait so, so the hadith say that uh, that Muhammad was receiving revelations from Allah, and while yeah. he was doing that, he was making very strange noises, like yeah. snorting like a camel. <laughs> and you brought this up to Muslims in a discussion, and they kicked you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got mad, <laughs> and, and it's called Speaker's Coiner. It's a debate group. It's I don't even know how I ended up in that group. I think one of them added us or something. I, I don't remember. Um, oh, I don't know. Anyways, it's yeah, so ridiculous. It's it's, oh, it's it is ridiculous, right? Okay. It, it, it's just it's just that, that just sounds there there are more hadith. There is for example another hadith in which uh Gundal, I'm sure you're very familiar with that one. It says that Muhammad whenever he would receive revelations he would hear a sound like uh, the ringing of a bell and he would get uh he would feel very uncomfortable and then the state of revelation would be over and he would be very sweaty and things like that. In this one you see that when he would receive a revelation from Allah he would make very strange noises and be under a cloak. And it just makes you think. I mean, when I think about this, I, I think about from the, the few or the many psychology lessons that I got, what I think about is that Muhammad clearly seems to have a mental disorder, which give him certain mm -hmm. uh, certain seizures and certain delusions, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. make him act and think in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And he has certain episodes after which he believes that he has received a certain revelation. And maybe uh, the whole idea that he is getting revelations from Allah because of his mental disorder made him actually believe or re reinforced his idea that he is a prophet and he started making up more of those revelations while also receiving these episodes, while receiving these seizures and these hallucinations. It simply looks like a bad mental problem i mean why is why is this how muhammad receives revelations if muhammad is the messenger of allah why is this how allah sends revelations to muhammad why are seizures noises the the way in which allah sends revelations to his holy messenger it's mm -hmm. very absurd yeah. And yeah, so we're gonna wrap it up on that and uh it's been a great show uh Abdul Gondal, any final words from you uh, like uh, speaking of uh, finishing off where AP left off and yep. the whole uh, mental health thing, I personally do believe that the best explanation for Muhammad uh, is temporal epilepsy mm -hmm. with a damage or focal origin on the left side of his brain because we see constantly that his face were turned to the right again and again when he'd get revelation. Oh, yeah. And then he'd go like this and then something like this and he'd move his lips while he's completely blanked out. Um, I have, uh, I'm making something special uh, on this thing, but I would say, yeah, that's probably one of the most uh, powerful explanations. And when you do survey the evidence, it becomes crystal clear that if you cannot pinpoint exactly what it was, at least we can know with a hundred percent surety that something of neurological origin was happening in his brain that caused all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, thank you that, that, you know, obviously always love your insight and, it's just amazing, you know, that you you're able to take your your knowledge of Quran and Hadith and now what you're learning and you know connect the two. Um, Ridwan, any final words from you? 
I really enjoyed this show. I think was, this was really, really great. We it, we went through a lot of fantastic stuff. I really loved this. We should uh, do something together on my channel too. Yeah. Uh, we should also talk about the whole uh, psychology of Muhammad and all that. Uh, but yeah, I, I really loved this. Thank you so much, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was a pleasure. Honestly, we definitely vibed. You know, this was like, I know we had a bunch of slides and we never got to them, but it was just like we were we had a thing going on where we were talking. You know, things just were connecting. We have a lot of things in common that you know to discuss, and a lot of overlap in you know some of the things that we've been debating and discussing with Muslim apologists and stuff. So it was great. We definitely vibe. Yeah, let's do this again. Let's definitely do this again. Um, and you know, very specific topics we can come up with and talk yeah. about. Uh, well, this I was, was kind of I was thinking if you want to do a presentation on like the mental health on AP channel, we can also have somebody like Ali Rizvi who is a pathologist certified and practicing medical doctor we can have him on the panel and then i have a couple other neurologist friends maybe we can talk about in detail it'd be cool i, like would, a presentation. I would love that i would love yeah that. yeah really do that yeah yeah, yeah sure. i would say i would i know less about that so maybe i wouldn't be a part of that one but like if we're going to do another one on the actual quran and hadith specifically not necessarily on the medical aspect then i'll be happy to be uh part of that definitely well. yeah definitely. for sure i would be i would be honored it would be awesome I'll, awesome. I'll, well, you know what? I'll start making the slides into like a PowerPoint. Sure. Uh, we yeah. did this one last year on Samir's channel, but I'll make a newer one. And in this one, I'll straight up, we'll go on your channel and we will uh, refute Farid <laughs> and his <laughs> doctor buddy as well, <laughs> yeah. because they also were involved in this back and yeah. forth with me. But yeah, it'll mm -hmm. be fun. I am awesome. I look forward to it. I'll be watching that one as well. And to everyone that's here, thank you for joining. Uh, do, do, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to all of my moderators, uh, Food and Religion, Beach Price, Andrew Mudden, and um, all of the supporters, Zara, and all the pa patrons as well. Thank you so much for continuing to support the channel and to help me to continue doing this work. Really appreciate it. Thank you to the All-Star team that we had today. This was a great show. Um, honestly, we can probably go on for five hours if you wanted to, <laughs> but I think we've covered enough. This is enough for anyone to leave Islam. There's enough in, I think, I'd say 10 minutes of the content, like honestly speaking. The accumulation of all of this, and, and surprisingly, nobody called in. Maybe not surprisingly, I don't know. I'm not sure. Like I said, I'm really happy when Muslims call in, and I'm a bit disappointed that no one called in today. Um, I really, really love it when Muslims call in, and we, you know, we're going to be respectful. We don't bite. We like having conversations, especially if you you know you don't agree with what we're saying. I'd love to hear it. So in in future call-in shows, uh, the two Abdullahs, please do call in. You know, we would appreciate your time. You don't have to be scared. Don't have to show your face even. Um, just be respectful, and we'll be respectful back. And like deal with the content and maybe maybe this content is you know we, we're not trying to be intimidating here we're not like we're not going to make fun of you or anything like that i mean we're making fun here but if you call in we'll be respectful for sure right um so do do engage with us i mean we want that we definitely want this sort of back and forth and we want it we want to make this a call-in show not just us talking by ourselves mm -hmm. right like we want it to be two uh two-way street not just a one-way street so so just keep that in mind and um yeah thank you guys and uh final word ap Stay away from Islam. Stay away from <laughs> Islam. And uh, Gondal, science, what do you say? Science Hafiz? Science Hafiz. Science Hafiz. Okay, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Take care. Everybody. Bye.